So where I'm at is that, uh, as Lucy mentioned, my wife, Rochelle, and I run a practice um, in Unley, and we see a lot of patients who come in with gastroenterological diseases and metabolic diseases, and um, and they're just, you wouldn't think gastroenterology was a specialty where these things were important, but I think it impacts on every specialty. And one of the things that frustrates me endlessly is that so many of my colleagues um, can't see the wood for the trees, not just in my specialty, but in so many other specialties and so many medicos. So you'll still hear from them, well, you, if you go on a high fat diet, you're gonna be in strife. Um, and they just can't see that it's the carbohydrates that are the main contributor to, to all of this. So anyway, I'll take you through my talk, because really what I want to do is talk about our experience. And I focused on the fatty liver patients, because obviously that's really part of my specialty. And the, the results that we see in our patients, I think this is the missing link, the missing link that our colleagues are not getting, is they're not seeing the results when people change their diet and lifestyle. And we are, and it's such an eye-opener. It so, makes you so passionate and so excited to see your patients come through the door more healthy. So fatty liver disease uh, is, or what's called non-alcoholic fatty liver, excess fat deposition in the liver usually detected on, on ultrasound. Uh, and when we talk about fatty liver disease, we usually exclude people from um, that if they've got excess alcohol intake, because it gives a, a similar picture. It's, if it's associated with abnormal liver function tests and inflammation within the liver, then you have sort of the next stage of fatty liver, which is called non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, or NASH. So you can be picked up as having a fatty liver without having NASH, but if you progress to developing NASH, then your liver is in trouble. Because um, NASH leads to progressive liver damage, fibrosis, cirrhosis, and liver failure. We don't really know how many people in Australia have, have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, but there have been some estimates, um, and maybe it's 22%, which is about 5 million people in Australia. We have about 1,700 deaths a year from NASH and cirrhosis and liver cancer, which is also a, a potential consequence. So how do you know if you have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? Well, you may not, but we look for those risk factors. So being overweight or obese, um, with a body mass index over 25 or 30, having high blood pressure, having triglycer high triglycerides, low HDL, so that's the good cholesterol in the blood, um, if you've got diabetes, but also if you've got insulin resistance, which is can be detected on a blood test, and it's the pre-diabetes stage. So if before you get diabetes and your blood sugars will still be fairly normal, you may well have insulin resistance. And this liver problem, the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, can develop even before you get to having diabetes if you're at risk of it. And it's more associated with a high waist circumference. So if you put on weight around the middle, as opposed to in other areas of your body, then you're more at risk of getting this condition. Abnormal liver function tests, particularly these ones called the GGT and ALT, uh, the gamma glutamyl transferase and alanine amino transferase. Um, if they're elevated, you, you may well have NASH. An ultrasound of the liver which shows a coarse, what they call a coarse echo texture um, and high shear wave elastography. So that's shear wave elastography is a fairly new test that we can do where we can actually measure how stiff your liver is by sending ultrasonic sound waves through it and, uh, and looking at how, how they bounce back and what the, the, the changes are. And it gives you an idea of whether there is fibrosis, which is scarring within the liver and damage going on within your liver. And of course you can have a liver biopsy, but um, they're not very popular nowadays and um, most people would not need to have a liver biopsy. If I have NASH, what are the risks? Well, there's an increased risk of progressive liver damage, including cirrhosis, liver failure, and primary liver cancer. However, you also, not surprisingly, have an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, including heart attack, arrhythmia, and stroke. And all of those cardiovascular problems, which are really the biggest killer, and even in patients with NASH, that's the biggest killer. 
if I have Nash, what can I do? So this is the current 2023 American Association for the Study of Liver Disease guidelines. Weight loss, using a low calorie, low fat diet. Blood sugar control if you're diabetic. You can stop drinking alcohol, but only if you have damage to your liver going on. You can drink coffee, apparently, three cups of coffee a day. You can take weight loss drugs, vitamin E, which the studies suggest maybe gives a marginal improvement, and you can have obesity surgery. You can have a statin if your cholesterol's up, but interestingly, the statin doesn't reduce your triglyceride, which is the main fat involved in insulin resistance and which is probably the main thing leading to cardiovascular problems. And they list on their website multiple failed drugs to stop the progression of fibrosis. And there's currently billions of dollars being spent trying to find drugs that will prevent liver fibrosis in this condition and stop this progression from just a little bit of inflammation in your liver to a scarred cirrhotic liver. And they don't mention a low carbohydrate diet. So this is what I think of the American Association for the Study of Liver Disease Guidelines. <laughs> I want to show, tell you a little bit about my personal journey. So I graduated from Adelaide University, very conservative institution in 1991. I got my fellowship of the Royal Australian College of Physicians in 1998, so that's my gastroenterology qualification. Again, a very conservative college. And I went on to do a PhD looking at healthy fats and bowel cancer prevention. For 20 years after that, I went on as a consultant gastroenterologist teaching the Australian Dietary Guidelines. <laughs> but I remembered that 20 years ago, I showed in my studies that healthy fats prevent bowel cancer. And guess what? They also prevent other cancers and cardiovascular disease and treat chronic inflammatory conditions and they're good for your brain function but I still didn't get it. So I was brought to low carb science, um, cooking, kicking and screaming. I couldn't admit that I was sugar addicted. James, I resonated with your ice cream slide. <laughs> and I began working with a keto nutritionist who I happened to be married to. <laughs> who relentlessly put academic papers under my nose and started to treat my patients with obesity, with diabetes, with irritable bowel syndrome, hypertension, reflux, cardiovascular disease, fatty liver disease, polycystic ovary syndrome, Alzheimer's, and inflammatory bowel diseases. And so what I wanna show you is, is what we do, what she does in the practice and the effect it has on my patients. So this is high intensity one-on-one -on -one counselling, which we think gives the best results, tailored to the individual, and it's low to very low carbohydrate. So very low carbohydrate, something sometimes called a ketogenic diet, because you try to get into nutritional ketosis, which is where your ketones, which are the product of you burning fat, become high. It's strange, but I still can't get my colleagues to understand that you can't burn fat without having ketones in your, in your body. You've got to actually, and you can't lose weight without burning fat. So it may involve medication management, intermittent fasting strategies, which are also really important, and other lifestyle changes. The diet we recommend is adequate protein. It has close monitoring, especially if you go very low carb. So it does have side effects, especially in the early stages, going low carb. You've got to get over those sugar cravings, and there are other side effects to monitor for. And particularly if you're on medication, then um, and already at an advanced stage of all these things, it, it's important that you work closely with somebody that knows what they're doing with this. This is the Verda Health Study, one of the key studies that my wife kept shoving under my nose. So this is, and I think James mentioned it too, it's a, so this was the 2019, it's a two-year case control study in diabetics of a continuous care intervention, ketogenic diet. Um, and what it showed was improved diabetic control and that diabetics need less medication on a, on a low-carbohydrate low diet. But also it showed improved liver markers. So these are the markers that I mentioned before 
basically the, these ones at the bottom here are your liver markers dropping. So in their study they showed improvement. Let's go back to the AA, AASLD recommendations. So this is a slide from a photo of the slide on their current website. So once again, lifestyle, have more veggies, fruits and omega-3 fatty acids, have less alcohol, less saturated fat, but less sugar and less total calories and get to exercising. Take medic medications, including the semaglutide that was mentioned by somebody who asked a good question earlier. But also from an endoscopy point of view, so this interests me because this is how the gastroenterologists work. We do a lot of endoscopies. And what they're recommending is that I what I should be doing is putting in intragastric balloons and doing endoscopic sleeve operations. So these are experimental uh, procedures which are being championed by small groups in the US and in Europe where you can have an endoscopy and have your stomach stapled without having to go through the more extensive abdominal operation. But they're experimental. Now, if I pursued that strategy for my patients with fatty liver disease, I would be a lot wealthier than what I am now. But I'm not interested in that approach. It makes good sense to treat fatty liver disease with a low carbohydrate diet. Most patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease have insulin resistance. Their insulin levels rise excessively with a carbohydrate rich meal, is what that means. So in insulin drives fat storage, which is James mentioned in his talk, and prevents fat breakdown. If we switch to a diet rich in healthy fats and low in carbohydrate, we reverse the metabolic issue with insulin resistance. So this is treating the cause of the condition. This is just another slide showing you some of the biochemistry, but you can focus on the triglyceride accumulation which occurs leading to NASH and cirrhosis of the liver and that insulin resistance, insulin resistance is king and key in managing this. So I guess it's time for me to be a rebel. <laughs> this is going, now I'm going to talk about fatty liver disease in our practice over the last five years. So we had 83 patients booked in to see our nutritionist who had fatty liver disease and 50 of those patients agreed to the intervention. So the other um, 33 patients disappointingly have decided that it's that intervention's too much for them or maybe they've received alternate advice from their doctors or their friends or whoever that a high fat diet's going to be bad for them and they shouldn't be on it. But 50 have agreed to come and have come to at least two appointments ranging from two to 18 and been averaging about five, five and a half appointments with a nutritionist for a low carb or keto diet. That was our age so we really could look at anybody who's who's willing to make the change which is quite a drastic change, so you've got to be ready for it. Um, but, but our average age is 56, so it's never, it's, and you know, older patients, it's never too late. And a predominance of female patients over male patients in our group. Of these 50 patients, we had 13 diabetics. Rochelle's gonna present later on, focusing more on the total number of diabetics and how she managed those. But just in this group with fatty liver, there were 13 patients. 19 of them had proven insulin resistance but for 18 them, we didn't know what their metabolic status was. Their average starting weight was 96 kilos with a BMI of 34.6. All 50 patients lost weight, every single patient. And the average weight lost about eight and a half kilos, um, which represents about 8.6% of body weight. Um, this p-value over here is statistical analysis showing that it's a significant drop. Um, it's not just a chance finding. The males actually seem to do better, a little bit better with their weight loss, but also their waist to hip ratio falls. So this is talking about this truncal obesity, that when you gain weight around the middle, because we're reversing the insulin resistance, this is where you lose the weight. So if you try to lose weight with a low calorie diet, you'll lose weight overall. But if you take this approach, then you'll lose weight around the middle, which is where you're accumulating the abnormal fat because we're reversing the metabolic defect. Of those 50 patients, we've got some liver function results before and after their dietary treatment. Um, so of 17 patients where we had those results, 16 of 17, so most of them had abnormal liver function tests before the treatment. 
and their GGT gamma glutide transferase fell from 63.9 on average down to 23, so it's less than half. Their liver function tests dramatically improve. And their ALT also goes down to about half on average. Basically, this is showing those drops in the liver function <coughs> tests. That one's probably better. Um, you can see these are, these are individual, each line is an individual patient, and you're seeing these dramatic drops in their, in their liver function tests. I want to talk to you about one particular lady who really, um, who, who, who was, what happened to her really blew me away. So this lady had, was 65. She was a retired academic, so quite an, um, a, a smart individual. She had high blood pressure. She was overweight. Her triglycerides, interesting, were, were okay, but she clearly had um, fatty liver disease. And she presented with these elevated liver function tests, this GGT and ALT. She had an ultrasound done, which showed fatty liver and a fibrosis score. Oh, I should, did I mention her alcohol intake? Yeah, she drank fairly heavily. Um, about half a bottle of wine a day was what she admitted to. Um, <laughs> and uh, and um, when we did her, her fatty liver disease, and we did this um, elastography test where we're looking for fibrosis and scarring in the liver, and she scored um, level four, which is the highest level of fibrosis and liver damage. And that's, although her, she didn't have any other signs of cirrhosis of the liver, that score of F4 means she's got early cirrhosis of the liver. So she's in big trouble. And she was told that she was in big trouble. And she said, life wouldn't be worth living if I gave up drinking alcohol, but I'll go on the diet. So she gradually lost weight over eight months. She lost 15.6 kilos, went from 78 to 62 kilos. Her BMI went from 33 to 26, so she went from being obese to being just slightly overweight. She lost 24 centimetres from her waist measurement. 24 centimetres. And her GGT, her liver function tests, went back to normal. She had a follow-up ultrasound, and Initially, the fibrosis score came down from F4 to F2, which was a very significant improvement. She managed to maintain her weight, and she had a further, further ultrasound early this year, and she's now got a score of F0. Now, as I said at the start of my talk, there are billions of dollars being put into finding drugs that will protect and reverse the fibrosis in people's livers. I've never seen this described in the medical literature. This is a lady who continued to drink alcohol, but went on a ketogenic diet, lost weight, and reversed, completely abolished her liver fibrosis. There's no sign, of, other than doing a liver biopsy, which I don't want to do, I mean, her, her fatty liver disease is gone, it's disappeared. And this is what the pictures look like from the ultrasound. So you can see on the left hand side this is the coarsening of the liver texture that you get with the fatty infiltration in the liver and this is her liver after the diet it's gone back to normal so in conclusion non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and NASH are significant health problems which can lead to many adverse health outcomes a high healthy fat low carbohydrate diet reverses the metabolic defect caused by insulin resistance and is therefore effective in weight loss and I believe can reverse NASH. That's not yet confirmed by any, well, there are some, the Verda Health people I mentioned before have shown some really good results, but this needs more scientific work. A tailored one-on-one -on -one approach, such as the approach we use at Unley Park Special Centre, can be highly effective. A high healthy fat, low carbohydrate diet is fabulous for your health, and I don't know how I could have missed it for 20 years. <laughs> I'd like to acknowledge all the pioneers of the low-carb science and thank my wife for opening my eyes and changing my career and the lives of my patients. Um, we also have a website which you can go to and Rochelle posts the academic papers that she shoves under my nose, she posts them on the website so you can actually see the links if you want to and go and see the science of how this is working. Thank you. <laughs>